in the end, like what would your advice be to that 16 year old kid who's staring in the mirror does not like what he sees, but is still running from adversity? Well, my biggest advice to him is that, first of all, he won't like what I say to him because I'm going to say the exact opposite of what the world, today's world is saying. So we read a bunch of books nowadays. As, as humans, we, we want to find out how to be someone else. What we don't do is we don't go inside. So literally turn yourself inside out. Read the book that says, like, like we're writing a book every day of our lives, but we never read that book. So what I would challenge this young man or, or, or young woman to do is you have to look inside of yourself to see what you really want. What, what are you passionate about? We use these words and these little phrases of only the strong survive and all this other crap. They're all just fucking words. I get so tired of hearing people just talking. Like right now, someone may think Goggins is just talking. <laughs> you don't know me. So when I speak, I speak from passion. I speak from experience. I, I, I speak from suffering. I have to tell this young man or woman that the only way I believe, and this is just my experience in life, the only way you're ever going to get to the other side of this journey is you have got to suffer, to grow. To grow, you must suffer. And some people will get it and some people won't. But they have to see what their journey is to start their journey. Several people live to be 100 years old and they have great lives and they have great kids. Their kids go to college and all sorts of stuff. But somewhere in their life, there was a point where they had a decision to make. They can go left or right on this path. Left was the easy route. Right was the hard route. A lot of people take the easy route. And they had a good life that way, but the better life was going to the right side. And you may have 20 years of pain and suffering to get past it, but a lot of us die never truly starting our journey. And I would tell this young person, you got to start your journey. It may suck, but it will. It will come out the other side where you're coasting. So it's really I want to go back to what you're saying about that. We write our own book, we're writing it every day, but we actually don't take the time to read it. So what do you as you were saying that here's what I was saying. Tell me if this is where you were going, that basically you're you're writing down these things that are sort of re becoming your identity about being weak, about avoiding suffering, about um, being soft, essentially. I mean, all, like all the things sort of by default, they're in that camp. And as you were saying that, I was imagining you sort of taking that pen and beginning to write your own story and writing things that you knew looking back on that you would be proud of. Right. Like going through the military and doing the hardest training, some of the ultra endurance stuff that you've done, which is on un broken feet. I mean, it's like so crazy. In fact, it, one, is that what you meant by writing that story? So what I meant by that is like every day we're seeing who we are as people. When I was growing up, I, I lied for people to accept me because I didn't accept myself. Mm. So I would make up stories so, so then you would accept me into your world. I would, uh, everything I did was for someone else to like me. It wasn't until I started reading my own book about how pathetic I was as a human being. I could blame my dad, I can blame kids at school, I could blame having health issues, ADD, my mom not being around. Great mom, but she was doing her thing. Right. I could blame a lot of people. And that's the book I was reading. And I put it off on everybody else. It wasn't until I said, you know what? For me to fix this, I got to read what the hell, what the fuck is wrong with David Goggins? Not, not blame anybody. Read my book and say, okay, I'm afraid of my shadow. How can I overcome that? Go in the military, get your ass kicked, do things you hate to do. Be uncomfortable every fucking day of your life. Roger that. I'm not the smartest kid in the world. Okay. Instead of somebody saying, oh, no, you're smart. No, no, don't say that to yourself. I said to myself, no, I'm a dumb motherfucker. Okay, roger that. How you get smarter? Educate yourself. So the things that we run from, we're running from the truth. We're running from the truth, man. So the only way I became successful was going towards the truth. As painful and as brutal as it is, it changed me. Mm. It, it allowed me to become, in my own right, who I am today. One of the most powerful things I think anybody can do, and this, so I used to struggle with self-esteem and my thing was I focused on being smart and I just wasn't that smart. I focused on being right and I was wrong a lot. 
And so it created this weird um, thing in my life where I would constantly try to put myself around people who are less and less intelligent so that I could feel good about myself. And the bad news is it's actually a really good strategy for that. Right. Being around people that were less intelligent than me really did make me feel good. Like I felt good about myself. But I literally referred to myself at the time as the king of remedial jobs because that, those were the only jobs that I could really shine at. Right. And it wasn't until I realized I can actually change what I build my self-esteem around. And I can start building my self-esteem around, instead of being right or being smart, being a learner and being willing to admit when I'm wrong. And so the thing that I began to build my self-esteem around was being willing and able to stare at my inadequacies. Right. right? What you said, like, I fully understand, like, how this, um, this interview is going to be, I mean, you warned me ahead of time, this interview is going to be, Bifurcating. People are going to love it and some people are going to hate it. And But dude, I so believe in the notion of looking at yourself and if you are pathetic, owning it, right? And right. saying, because my thing is you can change it, right? Which you have proven in no uncertain terms. That's it. But if you don't admit it, you're never going to be on the path to changing it. Exactly. Walk us through, because this is one of those crazy stories. I'd, I can't imagine how you pulled this off. Your first ultra marathon, which you got into like really fast, and one why you did it, because I think that's incredible. It, so this, the first ultra marathon wasn't smart at all, at all. Um, just so basically, what happened was I was at military free fall school with Morgan Luttrell. Marcus Luttrell, if you guys don't know, was the lone survivor. The guy, he um, was in a bad op. Op went bad. He was the only Navy SEAL that lived. Long story short. You got to get the book, read Lone Survivor, great story. Morgan is Marcus Luttrell's twin brother, mm. and I was there with Marcus. So what happened was myself and Morgan were in free fall school. At the same exact time, Marcus was in the worst incident in still history. So I knew that Marcus might be dead. He wasn't dead. Everybody else was dead. So I actually brought Morgan, you know, I actually told Morgan, hey, man, your brother was in a bad incident. I don't know if he's alive. I don't know what's going on. Long story short, Marcus is alive, and I go on to want to raise money for families. All these guys died. They all had kids. I want to raise money for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. It's a foundation where 100% tuition goes to these kids to go to college, you know, full tuition, whatever. So I found this great foundation. I'm going to raise money for it. So I said, you know what? I have to Google something that's, that's evil, something very hard. I knew nothing about ultra marathons. I hadn't even run a marathon. I knew nothing about this world. So I Googled the, you know, the top 10 hardest races in the world. And what comes up is a bad water 135. It's a 135 mile race through Death Valley in the summertime. I thought it was a stage race. I thought it was a race where you run like 20 miles, set up camp, you know, barbecue outside, and then go run some more the next day. So I called the race director up at the race and said, hey, Chris, his name is Chris Costin. I want to do your race. So we had a long conversation. You know, I was, I was much heavier then, and I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. How heavy are you at this point? I'm around between 240 to 270. Whoa. I'm in there. I'm in that range. Cause I've, my, my weight has varied a lot through the SEAL teams and out of sure. the SEAL teams. So I was a heavy guy. But the long and short of it all was I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. I was a big-time power lifter. I lifted weights heavy. That's what I did. Right. I just got back home from Iraq, went straight to free fall school, and then this happened. So I called Chris Costman up on a Wednesday. He says, look, man, the only way you can qualify for my race is to run 100 miles at one time in 24 hours or less. There happened to be a race that Saturday, so four days later. And he said, if you qualify by running 100 miles or less in 24 hours, I will consider you my race. I'm going to cut to the chase. I signed up for this race. It was called the San Diego One Day where you run around a one-mile track for 24 hours to see many miles you can get. Mm. My goal was 100 miles. So um, I got to mile 70, and I cleared 70 miles in like 12, 13 hours pretty quickly. But I was done. My feet were broken. I was stretch fractures, shin splints. Muscles were tearing. I was in bad shape. I was eating rich crackers and drinking <laughs> mile plates. That's all I had. No water. Didn't know what the hell I was doing out there had on some tube socks. It was just ridiculous. It was, it was a clown show. So I sat down at mile 70, and at this time I was married. And I, I look at my wife, and I was like, um, I'm, I'm messed up bad. So I literally start to turn white. 
And when a black guy turns white, you're pretty <laughs> fucked up. So here I am. I'm all fucked up in this chair. I'm at mile 70. They got 30 fucking miles to go. I'm jacked up. I got to go to the bathroom. And the, and the bathroom's like 20 feet from me. It's a porta potty. I can't get out of the fucking chair. So I'm peeing blood down my leg. Whoa. Pooping up my fucking back. And I got 30 miles to go. And I'm, I can't stand up because my, my blood pressure's all messed up. I've been in three hell weeks, ranger school, overcome so many obstacles in my life. This last 30 miles of this race is when I realized a human being is not so human anymore. We have the ability to go in such a space. If you're willing to suffer, and I mean suffer, your brain and your body, once connected together, can do anything. And this 30 miles was the life-changing moment. I was out of it. I was in the worst pain in my entire life. I was, to me, on the brink of death. And I was able to chunk this 30 damn miles into small pieces. I was so driven. And I'm not, not going to say motivated because motivation is crap. Motivation comes and goes. When you're driven, whatever's in front of you will get destroyed. Mm. So... I sat in this chair and I was so driven to succeed in this race. And, it, and at this time, everybody goes, were you thinking about the guys that died? And I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't. This became a personal thing. This became me against this race, me against the kids that called me nigger, me against me. It, it, it just became something that I took so, so violently personal. And... I broke this thing down into small pieces. I said, okay, I gotta get nutrition. I gotta be able to stand up before I can get off this curb and get off this chair and be able to go 30 miles. So I went through all these small steps and I, I was able to stand up. And then from standing up, I was literally walking around with my wife at the time and she goes, you're not gonna make the time. She goes, you're, running, I mean, you're, you're walking like 30 some minute miles. I got to mile 81 and the second she said that I'm not gonna make the time, I ran the last 19 miles nonstop. And I can show you right now when we get done with this. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you right now. This was years ago, and I had to put compression tape on my Whoa. ankle. And I had, so this was years ago. I had literally the size of half dollars. I had to get compression tape, and I taped up my ankles, and I taped up my feet. And that's how I got through that race. Was it like a hematoma? I mean, what are we, what no, was No, so what happened was, I, like, my shins hurt so bad mm. from having stretch fractures that the only way I could continue on Ooh. was I taped it so I wasn't doing the flexor motion mm -hmm. that, that activates your, your shins. So I taped my ankles and my shins up, and I got that from, because in my third hell week, they weren't going to let me go back through, you know, train anymore. Right. So I literally went through... All of Bud's, my last SEAL training, with stretch fractures and shin splints. And how I did it was I would take my ankles all the way up to my calf every morning. So for the first hour, the pain was excruciating. Mm. But what happened is my feet would go numb. And Whoa. I did that every single day for six months. Whoa. And that's how I got through my third hell week because I was so broken from the first two that the commander said, hey, the CEO said this is your last time we're sending you through. So that's how I got the idea to do that. So with the right, and, and people may listen to this and say, this guy is sadistic, he's crazy, he's, no, if you know how I came up, you realize I was just a scared kid that found drive and passion to be something much better than what he thought he was. Mm. That's all it is.